Hello, Father Larry Young here for my introduction to the Old Testament class. And today we're going to do the prophet Nahum. So let's get into this Nahum. It's only three chapters, folks. Very small. Nahum means comfort or comforted, presumably by the Lord. Okay. So very similar to uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah literally means Yahweh comforts. Okay. The Lord comforts. Nehemiah, one of the uh, guys with Ezra that helped restore Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. All right, now, he's from Elkosh, which is a town somewhere. I've heard different things. Uh, I've heard different uh, suggestions about where this town might be. I don't think we really know, so I'm not going to say. Elkosh. We know very little about Nahum. doesn't talk about himself too much in this book. Okay, it's basically a psalm. A big, long song. That's kind of how it reads. and uh, Or a poem, kind of based on this kind of theophanic vision, you know? Theophany is like a, phanane is a manifestation and, um, and uh, of God, theos, okay? Uh, theophanane, theos phanane. Okay, theophany, a manifestation of God, manifesting himself. So uh, some sort of prophetic vision here um, kind of is the inspiration for this psalm. Extolling the power and justice of God. Uh, basically over Nineveh, this is the great capital city of Assyria, which reigned supreme in the ancient Near East for like 300 years. They were the evil empire. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, and they uh, eventually were destroyed in 612 B.C. by Babylon. And Babylon and the Medes formed this kind of uh, Neo-Babylonian empire that just took over the world. And they became the next, the successor to Assyria as the evil empire before Persia came along and then Greece and then Rome and on and on and on. All right, so um, <clears throat> Nahum is writing to the, to the Ninevites, to the Assyrians in the city of Nineveh, basically just saying that you're going down. You know, your time has come. Uh, it's kind of like a sequel to the prophet Jonah. You know, Jonah was all about mercy upon Nineveh. Uh, these two can be read together, you know. 150 years apart, Jonah's writing 150 years before Nahum, and he's calling Nineveh to repentance. Uh, and they repent. So it's a book about God's mercy. That if we're willing to repent, if we turn from sin, if we turn to the Lord, He will forgive us absolutely. The grace, forgiving, forgiveness, and mercy of Almighty God, okay, uh, is, is without limits. But there is a time limit on it. Okay, at a certain point, if we don't turn back to the Lord, it's kind of like time's up. Uh, so it's the book of Nahum that uh, basically is the alarm clock. Like, this is their great getting up day. Uh, this is um, time to face the music. Uh, so their sins are coming back on their own head now. They're facing the judgment of God coming to them. Um, in the form of this uh, rising rival empire, of Babylon and the Medes. Okay, so, so anyway, Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC. They had this incredible city. It had like, according to a couple different uh, Greek historians, one writing around the beginning of the fourth century uh, BC now, a uh, Greek and a uh, contemporary of Socrates, actually one of his disciples. Socrates died in 399, remember? Okay, that's one of those fixed dates uh, that helps to kind of situate yourself, 399. So he was a disciple of his. and Somewhere around that time, uh, he wrote this history, and, and he described the city of Nineveh and said that it had 100-foot walls. He's kind of a historian. And then there's another guy, uh, that guy was name was Xenophon. Did I say that? Xenophon. Okay, then there's this other historian around just before the turn of the millennia, okay? So like, I don't know, 
50, 60 BC, a guy uh, named uh, Diodorus from Sicily, a Greek historian. And he also, in even a more exaggerated fact, fact, uh, facts, in a more exaggerated way, describes this city in terms that, you know, seem a little excessive. He says it had 100 foot walls, which is basically what Xenophon says. That's unbelievable. Uh, 100 foot walls. And that it had these towers that were 200 feet. He actually says 1,500 of these 200 foot towers all around the walls. Uh, that's, yeah, okay. Well, anyway, uh, the thing was big and it was impressive. Um, he also says that it had this moat around it, 60 feet deep and 150 feet wide and all this kind of thing. But uh, those are probably exaggerations. But look, and they were a huge and powerful, rich empire that reigned supreme for 300 years and ruled everybody. Everybody was terrified of them. They were very cruel. Violent. Nahum calls calls Nineveh the bloody city. Okay, so anyway, they were feared. Everybody around there is living in fear of the Assyrians and paying tribute to them and the rest of it. Okay, uh, so when they fell to the Babylonians, I mean, it shocked the world because they looked unbeatable. They looked invincible. Okay, it's kind of like it's hard to imagine as an American anybody defeating America. Okay, knocking us off the pedestal here, but it could totally happen. We don't know what's coming down range. Okay, we don't know. Some period of instability, some vulnerability emerges, some rising power or alliance forms and decides to put the squeeze on the United States of America. Uh, who knows? Who knows? You know, we don't know. No one foresaw this coming. Uh, maybe we'll just rot from inside like uh rome did just degrade um but the bottom line is uh it's only been a couple hundred year experiment here for the united states of america a little over 200 years we haven't even lasted as long as assyria and we got a long way to go to make it as long as rome did all right so look uh we're not invincible and indomitable the united states of america might be called something else someday might be something else or it might be split up. You know, we really don't know. So we got to take the long view here. God sees from the mountaintop. And look, man, everybody thought Assyria was it. And they were going to be around forever. And then Babylon came along and they thought, everybody thought they were just it. This is it. This is the, and then they go down to the Persians. And then the Persians get swept out by Alexander the Great. And then ancient Rome rears its head. And they just seem absolutely invincible and indomitable. And the Germans and the English and the French and the Americans and the Russians and the whole thing, okay? Uh, look, uh, you know, we're all, all flesh is grass, Ecclesiastes said. Vanity of vanities. Um, look, uh, no one's invincible, so they go down with all their towers and everything. From what I heard, they had their wall was built out of these giant stones, okay, made of like some kind of mud, hardened mud or something like that. So basically, after a three-month siege, the Babylonians somehow redirected the Tigris River, which it's built on, the city's on the bank of the Tigris River, somehow channeled the Tigris River or a portion of it, I don't know, towards or around the walls of Nineveh and basically eroded them with the water of the river until it just basically um, just undermined them and collapsed them, got through them, went through, got through the gates. I don't know, but it like flooded the city. And Nahum kind of alludes to that, even though he's prophesying about it, seems to allude to that uh, in his, uh, we're, we're going to see that because I want to read the whole thing. Because one thing you're going to notice about Nahum is this is fantastic poetry. Man, can this guy turn a phrase. And his language really pops and sizzles. So um, it's, it's, just, it's just great linguistically, you know. Uh, the word play and, 
you know, the descriptive language is just incredible. I wish we knew Hebrew and we could really listen to it in the Hebrew, but even in the English, it's just fantastic. So, so look, uh, ooh, Jonah demonstrate that. Yeah, I already told you that. Uh, God is the divine warrior king. That's kind of, uh, and Assyria is kind of like, you know, a type of all the nations like Edom was for Obadiah. It's kind of, you know, it becomes almost type, typological. Um, they're not invincible. And it just shocked the world. Like the Titanic was the unsinkable ship and everybody was in awe of this great ship with cleaving wing. I love it. I have on my wall, I, I printed out the poem uh, by, uh, uh, Thomas, hold on, uh, Thomas Hardy, the uh, famous poem about the Titanic. It's called The Convergence of the Twain. Read that. It's incredible. It's only about that long. And I have it up on my wall with a picture of the iceberg and a picture of the ship because I'm so impressed. That story so fascinates me of the Titanic. You know, the unsinkable ship. God couldn't sink this ship, boy. They set themselves up like a bowling pin when they said that. Well, look, it's sunk. Rocked the world. Um, and the Berlin Wall fell, you know? I mean, just, you know, these types of things that, uh, you know, we can relate to in our own time, more modern times, uh, that we can look at and say, man, that that just seems impossible, you know, um, for that empire to break up. The New England Patriots, Tom Brady's going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or whatever, or wherever he's going. Uh, you know, it's just, um, all right. Now, um, nothing is invincible down here. So, but the Lord is a sure defense amid wars. I like that. And it's very comforting to think, you know, how uh, there's assurances for the people of God amidst all this fiery judgment on Nineveh. God gives assurances to us that we can weather anything. And in a certain sense, if we cling to the Almighty, we are invincible. Need, huh? No earthly power is invincible, but the saints are in, indomitable, invincible uh, in a certain sense. When, they're, when we're united to God, we have the ultimate why to survive anyhow. And God's grace sustains us through all of our trials if we keep faith. Uh, so the Lord is a sure defense. So that's why our Lord in, in uh, you know, in the eschatological discourses in the synoptic gospels, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, you know, he's, he says, don't worry, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and there's going to be earthquakes and all kinds of signs. And look, all these things must come, you know. Uh, he who endures to the end will be saved. You know, just hang in there. All right. Uh, don't worry. So, all right. So basically this three-part structure, it's kind of like chapter one is who, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, this declaration of God's judgment on Assyria and the city of Nineveh is kind of chapter one. Um, and then chapter two is kind of like, how is this going to happen through an invasion? By a foreign nation. And then chapter 3, why? And then he kind of calls them out on their inhumanity. You know, notice, I mean, when he when he gets into it in chapter 3, it's not like he's citing the law of Moses here. He's like, it's just interesting. Just notice that as we're reading it, he's confronting a pagan nation that doesn't have the benefit of the law. Okay, Ten Commandments. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of ignorance there, but still, we all have a conscience, the voice of conscience, God put there. We know that we have, to, we can't be barbarians, okay? We know what cruelty is, all right? We know we're called to be kind and merciful to others, uh, to some extent, okay? Um, so, yeah, every society knows basic things that deep down we all know it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to murder, and, um, uh, Things like that. So the Ten Commandments in some ways are, much of it is written in our hearts. So 
There's one little warning I got to give you as you get into this too, that there's another one of these versification discrepancies. Kind of like there was with Micah, okay? So once again, the Hebrew Masoretic text uh, jumps ahead a little bit by one verse, right around the exchange of chapter one into, ver into chapter two. Uh, the Vulgate, St. Jerome kind of diverged from the Hebrew and Septuagint translation. Uh, he kind of um, um, cut off chapter one with verse 14. No, uh, he added verse 15. Oh, this is so confusing. But, uh, you know, he added uh, a verse 15, whereas the Hebrew, Greek, and the New American Bible, they, um, they cut it off at verse 14, chapter 1. So it begins chapter 2, verse 1 for my Bible, the RSV, C-E, uh, is uh, chapter 1, verse 15. All right. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get into the actual prophet here and just read this thing because it's it's really, uh, uh, you know, I have a good quote here by uh, somebody here described this writing, uh, a commentator described it in a way that I really like. So I thought I'd share this with you. Strong and brilliant. His poetry, his language, Nahum, is strong and brilliant, rumbles and rolls, leaps and flashes. You'll see what I mean. I'll try to do justice when I read it here uh, the best I can. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision, notice, vision, of Nahum of Elkosh. Nahum meaning comforted or comforted by Yahweh, comforted by the Lord. Okay. The Lord is a jealous God, an avenging God. Okay. Jealousy and, aven and vengeance. You know, in a holy, godly sense, not in some earthly fallen sense, but God's jealous of what belongs to him. Okay, he's not envious. Envy is when you look at somebody else and you wish evil upon them and you wish to destroy the good that they possess. Jealousy is different. You know, you, uh, you're, you're jealous, protective about what is your own. Uh, God's jealous about us. You know, uh, we are his possessions in a certain sense. Uh, he made us in his image and likeness, and he loves us. So it's, you know, it's um, when those terms are used of God, obviously we don't need mean them in a fallen human sense. We don't want to project anthropomorphic thoughts, visions, perceptions, uh, projections onto God, okay? Anthropomorphize him, okay? Anthropos is man. So you're projecting man-like qualities, particularly fallen human being, uh, the character defects and attitudes of men, okay? So we say this tongue-in-cheek, you know, but there, in a certain sense, you know, in a certain sense, there is an aspect of God's love that is jealous, but it's, uh, it's whatever it is, it's something good in the best possible sense. Uh, nothing sinful or fallen about that, uh, but he's really desirous and protective of what's good. Uh, he doesn't try to seek to control or dominate it, uh, but he loves it so much that it's almost kind of jealous. And he's vengeful, you know, in the sense of his perfect justice. So if Jonah was mercy, Nahum is about God's justice, okay? The Lord is a jealous God and, an av and avenging. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and of great might. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. That's verse 3 there. It's taken right out of Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7. It's virtually a quotation. The Lord is slow to anger and of great might. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon fades. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth is laid waste before him. The world and all that dwell therein. 
Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken asunder by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Uh, that's a beautiful statement there. I mean, just look, that's the key. The Lord is good. Once you establish that, uh, good, all the way through good, right? Uh, so that we shouldn't uh, project anything on him, any any uh, anthropomorphisms like jealousy and vengeance and, and wrath in the, in the fallen human sense, okay? Because he's good, you know? He's not a tame lion. The fawn said to little Lucy in the Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe, at least in the movie. Uh, he may not be tame, Aslan, the lion, Christ in Narnia, C.S. Lewis's children's books. Um, he's not a tame lion, but he's good. That covers everything, okay? Capital G, good. There is nothing evil in him, period, period. So you gotta have it's just basic theology there that straightens out a lot of these misconceptions or confusions when you hear anthropomorphic language describing God that you then you hear like the the new atheists you know uh, just absolutely lambasting God and accusing him of being this jealous wrathful tyrant. Uh, this masochistic, sadistic, whatever he is, you know. Uh, they just say terrible things about Almighty God and they're using biblical imagery and thing that's, uh, you know, we just, look, we, we all we know as human beings, we don't fully understand God. Uh, so we relate him to our experience, but he is completely other, utterly separate and different from us. A different kind of being. 100% good. But, you know, we use human modes of expression and uh, analogies for things. So these guys, you know, they're not scripture scholars. They don't know how to make those distinctions. So they they uh, they buy into it hook, line, and sinker. And they would read this and say, see that? See? A jealous God. He's jealous. And he's vengeful and spiteful and masochistic and sadistic. Tyrant, dictator, mean, uncle, whatever. Kid with a magnifying glass. Some weird kid up the street with a magnifying glass. Whatever. I mean, it's terrible things they say about God. Total misunderstanding. Total misunderstanding. He, the Lord, is good. He's good. The Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows them. That's... That little word yada again, okay? That's a word of intimacy, fellowship, friendship. He knows us, covenantal, personal covenant relationship with the living God. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows us. A stronghold in the day of trouble. See, there's consolation, even though Assyria is about is about to be taken to the woodshed by Nahum. Uh, and well, by God ultimately, but Nahum's predicting it. And uh, but there's comforting words in this prophet as well. Verse eight. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a full end of his adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Now maybe that's prophetic foresight there when he talks about an overflowing flood. With an overflowing flood, he will make a full end of his adversaries. Well, you know, it's just interesting that Nahum says that when, in fact, it was a flood. The city flooded. Uh, the river Tigris was diverted, and that's how the Babylonians and Medes were able to take the city with an overwhelming flood. Is that a prophetic prediction? Maybe. I'm open to it. Verse 9. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a full end. He will not take vengeance twice on his foes. Like entangled thorns, they are consumed like dry stubble. Um, did one not come from you who plotted evil against the Lord and counseled villainy? Thus says the Lord, though they be strong and many, they will be cut off 
and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off of you and will burst your bonds asunder. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated from the house of your gods. I will cut off the graven images and the molten image. I will make your grave for you are vile. Now, I just want to pause there for a second. Hit the pause button. You know, he hasn't even mentioned Assyria once. It's just interesting. Chapter 1 here, he doesn't even mention them. Or Babylon. So it's kind of mysterious, you know, who he's talking about here. Because, you know, he could probably be talking about anybody. You know, I mean, that's what I mean. It's kind of typological. You know, they're kind of a type or symbol of all, any of the nations. It's just interesting that he never really says takes a while until he really clearly identifies Assyria, um, you know, and names the city of Nineveh and so on, you know, so we know who he's talking about. But in the beginning, I don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously he begins an oracle concerning Nineveh, but it's just interesting. He doesn't really, you know, I just think it, it's, it's meant to be open-ended, open to insert uh, this prophet into any historical context uh, to uh, to shed light on uh, various historical circumstances of the people of God that they might find themselves in. Verse 15, this is a beautiful passage here. This is very much like Isaiah 52, 7. Same exact wording pretty much. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings. The word is euangelizomai, okay? The one who's bringing good news, the evangelist, uh, basically, uh, who proclaims peace. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings. Good news, euangelion, all right, who proclaims peace. Wow, somebody that's bringing good tidings, uh, have beautiful feet. So we should all have beautiful feet if we're evangelists. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the wicked come against you. He is utterly cut off. Verse Chapter 2 um, is kind of the how. All right, we talked about. The shatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road, gird your loins, collect all your strength. The Shatterer. Man, that sounds like the name of a professional wrestler. The Shatterer. Or some superhero or something. Uh, it's just kind of scary. The Shatterer has come up against you. Verse 2. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have stripped them and ruined their branches. I love that. Majesty, you know. Obviously, the anointed one, their king, but I don't know. It's kind of like the majesty of Jacob, the majesty of Israel. That applies to all of us. We are royalty. We have royal blood in our veins. The king of kings has made himself one with us. So, you know, we were the kings and queens of creation at the beginning, but now even more so in the book of Revelation. Christ says, he who conquers, I will sit with me on my throne. Is that awesome or what? He who conquers, chapter 3, verse 27, book of Revelation. He, he who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. We sit on the throne with the Messiah, with the Christ. Uh, anyway, I just love that. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunders have stripped them and ruined their branches. Beautiful. All right, back to judgment and ferocious vengeance here. Verse 3. The shield of his mighty men is red. Just listen to this language. This is just going to be um, a feast, a linguistic feast here or image feast of images that he's going to paint 
in, in our minds. It's scary stuff, but this is good. This is great. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. Now, I've been told the only soldiers in the ancient Near East that wore scarlet uniforms were the Babylonians. Of course, he's writing this, presumably, before he could know such a thing. Um, possibly, you know, he was writing this before Babylon was really uh, a power, a force uh, to be reckoned with. All right, the chariots flash like flame when mustered in array. The chargers prance. The chariots rage in the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. The officers are summoned. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The mantlet is set up. The river gates are opened. The palace is in dismay. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off. Her maidens lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every precious thing. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts faint and knees tremble. Anguish is on all loins. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den? The cave of the young lion where the lion brought his prey, where his cubs were with none to disturb. The lion tore enough for his whelps and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall no more be heard. All faces grow pale. That's an expression that Joel picks up on. Remember, Joel was like an amalgamation of all these prophets. He kind of like borrowed different phrases from all these different ones. He borrowed that one from Joel, from, uh, excuse me, from Nahum, presumably. All faces grow pale. Um, this business about the lion, I think, is really interesting when you contrast it with Micah. Because um, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, they're lions. Yeah, sure. I mean, even the Assyrians, you know, apparently they used the lion was like their symbol, national symbol like ours. Americans is an eagle. Okay, for them it was the lion. Okay, and... Uh, so where's the lion's den? All these young lions. Hey, uh, when the Lord says, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. There's that divine warrior king. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. And I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions warrior king here um wow that's a scary thought if the lord god the lord of hosts says behold i am against you uh who can you who can you run to who can you appeal to who's going to help you um if god is with us who can be against us but if god is against us who are we going to turn to as a refuge from God, right? Uh, so that is a really scary thought. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. Pray God, he is never against us. We never do anything, put ourselves in a position where the Lord has to say something like that to us. Oh my goodness. So what I really like too here is, in Micah 5 eight, we're gonna look at something here. I just think this is fascinating because Micah is talking about lions too, but he's likening Jacob uh, and Israel. He's um, referring to as a lion, like a lion. But what's different is, you know, they're going to get wiped out. He's telling them, look, you're going to get, you're going to end up going to Babylon and you're going to be, you know, taken away in exile to Babylon. 
And, and then, then you're going to be rescued, though. You're going to be rescued. So basically, he's describing, you know, this Assyrian, you know, Babylon. And now he's back in verse chapter 5 with Assyria. Sorry, another little interruption there. But uh, I was talking about Assyria. So let's get back into this here. This this idea that uh, in chapter 5 of Micah, you know, this idea that Assyria is going to come down and obliterate the, you know, the tribes of Israel, these 10 northern tribes. So, and, uh, but then it's so interesting in verse 7 here, he says, chapter 5, verse 7 of Micah, then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of the people. You know, we're like leaven in the midst of the dough. We talked about this when we went through Micah. You know, the salt of the world, salt of the earth. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers upon the grass. Something very mysterious about that. The mysterious working of grace. It's going to arc off of my people. They are going to be 11 and they're going to cause the dough to rise. It's very mysterious like dew which tarry not for men, nor wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations. They're going to go out there. I think this is the new evangelization. I think this is the new covenant. I think this is Christianity. This is the in the midst of many peoples. Now notice here in verse 8. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the flocks of sheep which when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries and all your enemies shall be cut off. We did it without a spear, without a sword, without a chariot. And in that day says the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land, throw down your strongholds, cut off your sorceries, your soothsayers, your images, your pillars, all of it. God's going to just bring it all down without uh, without any violence whatsoever. It's like a conquest of the world from within. The kingdom of God is within you. Our Lord uh, has to tell the Pharisees and scribes, do you not realize the kingdom of God is within you? It's in your midst. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He sells them in Luke 17. Don't look around. Hey, here it is. There it is. It's a mysterious thing like dew. Okay, the dew of the Holy Spirit. It's going to arc off of believers and it's going to land on other people. But, you know, what I like there and why I mention this is this notion that, um, you know, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's got this plan that... Um, is just so awesome, superior to anything we would have come up with. So he does it in a nonviolent way and brings about this world rule in a certain sense. And he reigns from heaven and uh, a kingdom that will never end. That's a spiritual kingdom, ultimately. Uh, yes, it's also an institution. Um, it's both. But, um, but ultimately, it's spiritual. And, and it's like a lion. Because it's effective and it's it devours souls for God, you know, and not in a negative sense. But I mean, it's like a big fish net, you know. I mean, but this image of a lion, you know, we're just it's fierce, um, but it's it's in a funny, hidden sort of way. Um, it is ferocious because um, it's like a fire-consuming, devouring fire of love. It's a pretty scary image. Um, God is like a devouring, consuming fire. And the church, to think of the church as a lion, um, a loving lion. You know, maybe that's where C.S. Lewis got his image of a lion for, you know, his Narnia Chronicles, Aslan, his Jesus in this uh, make-believe world. But I, I just like this thinking about the church as a lion um, and um, who's going to conquer the enemies of God. 
all your enemies shall be cut off. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries. When this lion goes through the flocks of sheep, when it's put out there into the midst of the peoples, oh, it shall be among the nations. Uh, I love that. All right, but in this case, the lion of Assyria, you know, that's what's so interesting. I swear there's a little play here because he's talking about, in Micah here, he's talking about Assyria. He's talking about Assyria in chapter 5 and the destruction of the northern tribes. Chapter 5, and this shall be peace. When the Assyrian comes into your land and treads upon our soil, they shall rule the land of Assyria with the sword. Um, but there's going to be a remnant, and yeah, they're going to be cast out into the midst of the peoples like do. But they're going to be out there in the midst of all these peoples, they're going to become like a lion and they're going to convert the whole world and pagan shrines are going to be torn down like you hear at the end here images pillars ashram torn down sorcery soothsayers gone i uh i just love this contrast here that uh assyria thinks they're the great lion and world domination you know they're all about dominating the world, but, you know, eventually they're going to get eaten up by Babylon here. So Nahum is using this image against them and saying, hey, you big, ferocious lion, guess what? Uh, you're going to be tore up by the sword. You're going to be devoured. Sword shall devour you, young lions, because the Lord is against you. But God can do amazing things with the weak of this world. May, we may not feel like a lion, our little church in the world, um, but we are. Powers flowing through our church. Uh, let's get into chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city. There it is, Nineveh. Woe to the bloody city. All full of lies and booty, no end to the plunder. The crack of whip and rumble of wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot. Horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear. Host of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. And all for the countless harlotries of the harlot, just like Babylon and the book of Revelation, the great harlot. Graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her harlotries and peoples with her charms. Very similar to the book of Revelation's description of Babylon, because both of them are kind of a type. Okay, Behold, and in, in the case of um, the book of Revelation, Babylon is really Rome. Okay, um, Behold, I am against you, said, and, and, and St. Peter ends his second letter, you know, from Babylon. You know, but he, we know he's in Rome, but he actually refers to it as Babylon. Um, greeting you from Babylon. Let me see, it's his first letter. First letter. Yeah, greetings. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So does my son Mark. Uh, so, you know, he, anyway. So behold, I am against you, verse 5, says the Lord of hosts, and will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will let nations look on your nakedness and kingdoms on your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a gazing stock and all who look on you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh. First mention of uh, Nineveh. Wasted is Nineveh, besides verse one, chapter one, verse one. Wasted is Nineveh who will bemoan her. When shall I seek comforters for her? Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile? 363 B.C., okay, this Egyptian city was conquered by the Assyrians. Uh, and they thought they were impregnable and invincible. And uh, they went down. So, you know, obviously that's, he's referring, he's looking back at that as a historical event. Uh, and 
then that was 363 BC, and Assyria was conquered in 612 BC. So he's got to be writing this sometime between 612 and 663, somewhere in there. Nahum is writing this to the Assyrians, but he's referring here to the th city of Thebes in Egypt. Verse 8, are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart a sea, and water her wall? Ethiopia too was her strength, Egypt too, and without and that without limit. But uh, Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she was carried away, she went into captivity, her little ones were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honored men, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunken, you will be dazed, you will seek a refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your foes. Fire has devoured your bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. There will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locusts settling on the fences. In a day of cold when the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no assuaging your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news of you clap their hands. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? That, folks, is the book of Nahum. Uh, it's a good reminder to all of us. And we're not invincible. No one is invincible. And the clock is ticking. And eventually time will run out. The sands of the hourglass will run out. And the hour of mercy will end. And it will be the time of judgment if we don't turn to the Lord and repent. Um, you know, he doesn't plow. So many times Isaiah said things like that. You know, I don't just keep on plowing endlessly, you know. Eventually I'm going to plant. I don't just let it grow and grow and grow. Eventually I'm going to harvest. I'm going to wield the sickle. Okay. Um, so anyway, it's a very sobering book, this book of Nahum. And that city was absolutely leveled. You know, it disappeared off the face of the earth for like over 2,000 years. 2,500, whatever years, you know, years. Uh, because basically, um, yeah, it just became desolation and ruin. Uh, these descriptions here, you know, of this total, total destruction. Um, that's exactly what happened. Because, uh, yeah, they didn't even know where the city of Nineveh was for all those years, over, a couple, over two millennia. And it, was, it wasn't until the 1800s, sometime in the 1800s, a British guy was walking out there and he saw this pile of rubble, giant pile of rubble. And he started picking around and suddenly he realized, I've discovered the lost city of Nineveh. And it's pretty much a confirmed archaeological site now. Uh, but for years, all this desolation, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just really sad and it just became a haunt a haunted place uh where the uh you know just absolutely um so anyway all right enough on this next time we're going to do the the book of the prophet habakkuk it's going to be really good so hope to see you next next time god bless you